Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to worship. We thank you that you have presented us with your word and with your words. We ask that you would help to enlighten us, to help us grow in understanding and faith through this time that we spend together. In Jesus' name, amen. Since we're talking about the commandments, and that's a good thing, because they're really not talked about enough, and that's a bad thing, and I hope by the time we're done today that you'll understand what I mean by those statements, that the commandments are more of a good thing than we think they are. But we have this law and gospel distinction that Luther made such a big stink about for all of his years, and the commandments are considered the law, and the gospel is considered something about forgiveness and mercy. And so I thought that it was only appropriate that we start with a little story about a man who dies, and he meets Peter at the pearly gates, the proverbial pearly gates. And St. Peter tells the man, he says, well, in order to pass through the gates and get into heaven, you have to have earned 300 points in the course of your life. And so the man says, well, all right. He figures that's not too bad. So he says, how do I know how many points I have? And Peter says, well, tell me what you did with your life. And so the man says, well, he says, let's see. He says, I taught Sunday school. I served as an elder in my church for 50 years. I sang in the choir. I brought food to the widows. And I visited the homebound for many years. And Peter says, that is wonderful. He said, that's so great. He says, that's one point. <laughs> and the man said, one point? He says, uh-huh, OK, well, let's see. He says, I obeyed all the traffic laws. I think he was lying. <laughs> I never stole anything in my life. I always told the truth. I stayed faithful to my wife for our entire marriage, and I raised our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and today they're all happily married, and they have good kids of their own. And Peter says, that is so great. He says, that's another point. Now you have two. And the guy says, oh, man. He says, all right, he says, uh, I tithed 10% of every dollar I made. I led several clothing drives. I paid my taxes on time. I prayed every day of my adult life. I read the Bible every day, and I witnessed to hundreds of people, and I even helped a few become a part of the church. And Peter says, awesome. That's three points. Only 297 to go. <laughs> and the man is now shaking in his boots a little bit. And he says, shoot, there's no way. He says, it's only by the grace of God that anybody will get through these gates. And Peter said, bingo. That's 297 points. Come on in. So whenever we talk about the commandments, we have to talk about those kinds of things first. It just so happened that around the same time that uh, Pastor Chris asked me if I would uh, preach this sermon, and it's a very good theme that he, he has chosen. It's all about generosity. What does this mean? And what he and his friend Mark are trying to accomplish, and I think it's a very admirable goal, is to let us know that there is generosity in the commandments. Because so often we see so much judgment in the commandments. And there, it, where is the generosity? And that's what we're trying to ferret out and uncover. What is the generosity? So it just so happened, like I said, that that I started to, I, I read a, a, 
a, a psalm or a portion of a psalm every morning and then a little devotional piece that goes along with it. And it just so happened that I started to read Psalm 119. Are you familiar with Psalm 119? Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It is 176 verses. If I start now, <laughs> I can get to the end in 20 or 30 minutes and then we can do the rest of the sermon. <laughs> you ready? You see, it consists of 20 or nine, uh, 20 nine verse stanzas. 20 stanzas, each with eight or nine verses. What's amazing about it is that it is called an acrostic psalm. You know what an acrostic psalm is? It means that every line in that stanza of the psalm begins with the same letter of the alphabet. And the reason that it has 20 stanzas is because there is 20 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. We have 26, they have 20. Alpha, Aleph, Bet, and Gimel are their first three. So that means in the first stanza, every line begins with Aleph. In the second stanza, every line begins with Bet. In the next stanza, every line, all the way through the entire alphabet. Do you realize how much work? This is a painstaking process. The person who wrote this psalm had incredible diligence and commitment. And it was very important. And I find it not coincidental and maybe something that we just don't notice enough that the single longest chapter in the entire Bible is about the law. It's about the commandments. The 119th Psalm is an ode to the commandments. The guy who wrote this, and we believe, nobody knows for sure, but they believe that it was Ezra. Ezra is one of the people who helped to lead the people out of the Babylonian exile, and he's the one who guided them back to a worship life, where they lived by the statutes of the Lord their God. He has his own book in the Old Testament, if you're interested. This psalmist wants to be faithful to God's laws. That is what is most important to him in life. He sincerely prays for the grace to live in companionship with them. He writes, on the way of your commandments I run, for you make my heart capacious. You know what capacious means? What word sounds similar to capacious? Capacity. Okay, capacious means large, incredibly large capacity. And so he says, on the way of your commandments I run, for you make my heart capacious. He asks God over and over again throughout this psalm, please enlarge my heart. And he refers to the commandments and the law over and over again. He wants to live in companionship with them. He does not see them as something separate. He wants to live in companionship with them. And he is convinced, and he uses all these different words. He doesn't just call them commands. He calls them commands. He calls them words. He calls them precepts. He calls them utterances. He calls them statutes. All these different synonyms he uses. And he is convinced that it is these words and laws of God that will enrich his person and become a source of contentment in his life. He is convinced. He's on a pilgrimage. I think that's why the psalm is so long. 176 verses, because he's on a pilgrimage. He's not just writing about one time when he had this feeling about something and then it passed. And he knows that on this pilgrimage to get there, he needs God's help. Thus his prayer for God to enlarge his heart. He wants his heart to be roomy enough for God's words. He wants God's words to fit in there right beside his neediness 
to, 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 to fit in there right beside his evil inclinations, his nastiness. He wants room next to those things for God's laws to fit. He craves a relationship with God. Anybody know what might be the most famous verse from the psalm? The one that everybody would recognize? Your word, your words, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. See, so he talks about the immediate, the moment. Your word is a light uh, to my feet or a lamp to my feet. So the immediate is covered, but then it is also a light to my path. It spreads out in front of me and it leads me on the way because he is trying to become a different person. He is trying to grow. And when he asks for a capacious heart, he wants a definite relationship. Now, along with this, some of this is going to be new to you, I'm sure. I think I mentioned in a previous sermon here that the Ten Commandments were not known in ancient times as the Ten Commandments. That all the ancient rabbis, when they talked about them, when they discussed them, when they uh, gave homilies about them or talks to the people, they didn't call them the Ten Commandments. They called them the Ten Words. And that's a very important distinction that we often miss. In fact, if you go back and you look at Exodus chapter 20 where the Ten Commandments are presented to us, the first verse says, not the Lord spoke these commands. It says, and the Lord spoke these words. And in fact, a lot of those words are less than three syllables in the Hebrew. That's the way the people learned them. That's the way they remembered them. It was not thou shalt not commit adultery. It was no adultery, no steal, no kill. And that's how they remembered them. They were short. They were brief. They were concise. They could be fit right into their world and their life. And they were known as words. The Jews are also very good at commemorations. They annually celebrate great events in their history. And there was a specific day that God gave the people the ten words. They were slaves in Egypt. God sent Moses. They were liberated. Moses led them through the Red Sea. What did they have right before they left that night to cross through the Red Sea? The Passover meal, the angel of death, all those things. And off they went. 49 days later, they arrived at the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses went up the mountain. And there was such a, such a demonstration of God's holiness all around them. There was thunder, the sky was rumbling, there was sun and then there was moon and there was clouds and there, everything, there was noises, there was, it, it, it was almost an eerie feeling. It was so holy and yet so intimidating to the people that they actually said to Moses, you talk to God and then tell us what he said. We don't want to get too close. And so on the 50th day, Moses was given the ten words. Does this remind you of anything else? We celebrate an occasion called the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is equivalent to the Jewish Passover. And now Jesus in the Lord's Supper has become the Passover lamb instead of the sheep. And then what happens 50 days later? What happens 50 days after the Lord's Supper? Pentecost, right. 
the Holy Spirit descends on the disciples. They find a new boldness. The word has come to them in a whole new way. So that means all of these ancient things are being updated in the work and the life of Jesus. So they, they call this the Festival of Weeks because it was seven weeks after the Passover. And in ancient Israel, and you can go ahead to the slides now, I actually had uh, Pastor Chris make some slides to show how much I have grown. <laughs> <laughs> Because I have never used a slide, and the first service I was more confused because when Pastor Chris made the slides, he made them green. But when I see them up there, they're black and white, and so I was confused. <laughs> but now I'm not, because I've learned some more. Okay, and these first ones, these are verses that come from the... Uh, the 119th Psalm. The first one about enlarging the heart, the capacious heart. The second one, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. On to the next one. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. And then on to the next one, which is a filler slide, I believe. See, I, word, I learned the word filler slide. Yeah, now you can pass the filler slide and we'll go on to this one. There, yes, the ketubah, that's the one we want. You know what a ketubah is? The ketubah is a contract. I didn't know what it was either, and then years ago, I was in New York City for some occasion. I have no idea why anymore. I'm from that area. And I went into a Jewish bookstore. If ever I see a bookstore, I must go in. It's the 11th commandment. <clears throat> and when I went into the bookstore, on the wall, they had ketubahs. And I thought, what's a ketubah? So I went and I looked at it more closely, and a ketubah is a contract. It is a marriage contract. When people in the Jewish faith get married, they have a written ketubah. And they sign the ketubah. And the rabbi signs the ketubah, and they put it up on the wall in their home. And the ketubah states the terms of their marriage and their contract in a godly way. And so this is kind of the introduction, because what happened is every year at the time of the Festival of Weeks, in many Jewish communities, they, the people, get married. Who do they marry? They marry God. Okay. And this is the introduction to the contract. The invisible God came forth from Sinai 3,300 years ago, and the bridegroom, who is God, said to the lovely, pious, and virtuous bride, which is the people of Israel, who won his favor and are as beautiful as the moon and as radiant as the sun. Next slide. And here's what God says. This is God's vow of marriage to the people. People of Israel, be my mate according to the law of Moses and the law of Israel, and I will honor, support, and maintain you. I will be your refuge and your shelter in everlasting mercy. I will honor, support, and maintain you and be your refuge and shelter in everlasting mercy. He is marrying his people. On to the next slide. And then each of God's people, the bridegroom, or each of God's ten words is read aloud. Each of the commandments is read aloud. And after each of the commandments, the people respond, we will hear and we will do. They're marrying God. And at the core of the marriage vow is the ten words the commands that God gave them. We will hear and we will do. The bride, the people of Israel, consent to become God's mate, and it's pretty amazing. The people go on. Is there a next slide or is this the last one? Okay. 
stupid me. The people go on to pledge to God that they will have an understanding heart, ears that listen for the words of God, and eyes that see the world through God's eyes. That's the vow that they take. And there is a lesson in all this. I don't tell you this for nothing. There is a lesson in all this, and the lesson is this. The Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, are part of a relationship. They are not just a list of standards. They are not mere measuring sticks. They are grace-filled vessels, not commandments. They're more words. They're utterances. They're a way of living. It's us people, it's human beings who've put the negative spin on them because they're, I guess, because there's more thou shalt nots in the commandments than thou shalt. So we have taken all the thou shalt nots and shoved them off to the side. Who needs those? I can take care of myself. I want to make my own choices and my own decisions. And we shove them off to the side. I have my rights. Anytime I hear somebody say I have my rights, it concerns me. We have paid lip service to the commandments in our culture. We've done things like this to pay lip service to them. We engrave them into stone monuments. And then we take the stone monuments and we stick them in a courthouse at the end of a hallway somewhere so that when people walk into the courthouse, they can see the Ten Commandments there and they can acknowledge that we have these rules. And then politicians of all stripes stand up and talk about these commandments and the Judeo-Christian values of our country, and if you asked any of them to name three of these commandments, they couldn't do it. But that's what we have done. We have taken these commands and we've kind of shuffled them off to the side because they're not really convenient anymore. So I wanted to do something with this. When we use the word commandments, we acknowledge that they are rules. They are standards for behavior that we measure ourselves against. We measure ourselves, okay? Commandments, they stand out here. They're like a monument, and they're out here for us to see. We're on commandments five, six, and seven today. Five, do not kill, do not murder. Well, where do I fall when it comes to, to killing? Well, we can say, I, 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 I've never shot anybody. I've never been an axe murderer or a serial. I'm, I'm OK, so I'm pretty much up here. All right? Maybe not quite to the top, but up there. But you know then, Martin Luther wrote in his large catechism, and you want to hear what he said about this commandment? He said, the whole sum and substance of the commandment against killing is this. <coughs> Cause no physical harm to anyone. Oops. Do not suggest physical injury for anyone. Oops. Sanction no harm against anyone. Oops. Finally, our heart should not be hostile to anyone or wish him ill in a spirit of anger or hatred. Keep your body and your soul blameless. That's what it is to live by the rule. Commandment six, do not commit adultery. So, okay, I never cheated on my spouse. But then Luther says, not only is the external act of adultery prohibited, your heart, the words of your mouth, and your whole body are to be chaste. I mean, the first guy that we know that admitted to this was who? Jimmy Carter. Where? In Playboy magazine, in a Playboy interview. I have lusted, he said. And down and down and down we go. 
do not steal. This goes beyond our usual understanding, too. I think that stealing is probably something we've all done. I stole a bunch of little cars from a, a Woolworths when they still existed. I, I might have put them out of business by stealing those cars. <laughs> <laughs> this could be my fault. And I did get punished for it. And I will confess to having taken some of the glasses from restaurants for souvenirs and <laughs> things like that. I know none of you have ever stolen anything. But Luther goes on to describe this a little bit more. He says, we should not define stealing too narrowly. It's not just taking something, but extend it to all of our dealings with neighbors. So we never stole much, but okay, we're up here. He says, to sum up, we are forbidden to harm or wrong our neighbor in any conceivable way. I don't know, I think I'm slipping. We are even commanded to check to prevent wrongs against our neighbor and to promote his interests. We live in a world where sadly we don't even know most of our neighbors, never mind promote their interests. So we have the commandments, and they are this yardstick. And because of everything that we just discussed, that's the reason that they're all off to the side, that we've put them onto monuments, and we've forgotten about them, and we've shoved them aside. This is a measuring stick, and it's external. It's separate from the core of our being, and it keeps whacking us over the head. See how considerate that I whack my own head instead of yours? <laughs> So these commands have become more like relics that stand off to the side. They turn, they tell us much more about our failures than about our potential. That's what we believe. But a word is different. Ten words. A word is different. Remember how John framed the word in his gospel, in the beginning, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, lived among us. So a word is not a relic that sits out here. A word is something, and this is the way I came up with to demonstrate a word. You see this little, a word is with us. A word is in our midst. A word moves and flows and travels and goes places and becomes a part of who we are. And it takes us places because it goes places with us. The word was God and with God. So word is more like this little laser. A commandment lives outside of us over here, and it knocks us over the head once in a while to get our attention. And so we say, I'm tired of being knocked over the head, so I'll put the commandments not only over here, I'll just put the whole ruler in the closet because it reminds us of our weakness. But the word enters our minds and our hearts and our lives. It is a companion. It is a part of us. And this, what I'm talking about with the word, is what the writer of the 119th Psalm is after. All of his vows and all of his striving is about the words of God becoming alive, the words of God becoming incarnate in us. The prayer of the psalmist is really, let the words of God live in me. And that's what the ketubah, the marriage contract between God's people and God is all about. God, the bridegroom, invites the bride, his people, to enter into a personal relationship with him. And then each and every year on the Festival of Weeks, they renew the vow. 
God presents his love, his word, his person to us. He puts it among us. He puts it within us. He vows to be present in us, through us, and to us. He promises never to, to break that vow. And he invites us into a relationship. And the people say, I do. God and Lord, become one with me. Let your word live in me, in my heart, in my mind. And let the world see you when they see me. And now we have to have one other fact in here. The 10 words along with the other 600 plus laws that are in the Old Testament were given originally to a specific people for a specific purpose. Remember at the time of the Exodus when Moses led the people out of Egypt and across the sea. At that time, the people of Israel had been slaves for 420 years. How many people do you think were alive in Israel who had ever known a moment of freedom in their life? Give you a hint. Zero. There was not a human being among them who had ever lived as a free person. Every day they were told when to get up, when to go to bed, when to eat, when to toilet, when to bathe, when to work, when to rest. Their entire life was imposed on them by Egyptian taskmasters who had cruelty in their hearts, rulers in their hands, and whips and swords to reinforce the message. So with his holiness and majesty on full display, God gave the people 10 words. And he gave them the words not to stifle them, but to encourage them, to help them exercise their gift of freedom responsibly. God was saying, these words will teach you how to live together without hurting each other and without killing each other. And if you live according to these words, you will find yourself living in a culture that everybody will be pleased to be a part of. That's why the words are intended to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. These 10 words were way back then and still today are the centerpiece of human liberation. They are not about bondage. They are not about stifling. They are not about discouragement. They are true freedom. And there is not, that is why there is not a belief system on the face of the earth, not one belief system on the face of the earth that does not have a set of similar injunctions to the Ten Commandments. They're a gift from the heart of God. See that behind me? The heart of God is at the cross. Am I pointing it in the right place? <laughs> the heart of God to the heart of us, of people. It is never a bad thing to measure ourselves against a higher standard. It isn't. Even Luther is clear that we can only recognize our need for God's love and mercy when we realize our need for help. So the judgment that we feel from the 10 words, though, is just a, a teensy part of what they are. At their core, they are a gift. They breed generosity, and they create in us the capacity to give and the capacity to love. The 10 words only became a burden for human beings when they no longer lived from the inside out. When we stopped living from the inside, we made them a set of external obligations. This is the way I have to live. And then we increasingly said, well, I don't want to live that way, so I'll put them over here, and then I'll put them over here, and then I'll put them over here, and I'll finally get them in the closet. And they became a set of external obligations. They deteriorated from being gifts to being goals. They became obligations and adversaries. But when the human beings cast the 10 words to the side, you know what? They had to break all the commandments to do it. So let me ask you a quick question. We hear lots of talk about how no one has ever kept the word successfully or adequately. 
which is a big reason why they've been discarded. Why beat our proverbial heads against the, law, uh, the wall trying to accomplish the impossible? So my question, has a human being ever lived who kept the ten words? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. And who or what is Jesus? Yes, here the, here, but here the, this important distinction once again. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is John talking about? Jesus. Jesus is the Word made flesh. And it's suddenly not a stretch to say that when God gave people the ten words, God was giving the people way, way back, thousands of years ago, when he gave Moses those words and handed them on to the people, he was giving the people Jesus in his disguise. Or Jesus in his earlier incarnation. Jesus is the Ten Commandments in their completeness. He is the Ten Words made flesh. He is the Ten Words dwelling among us. His life, death, and resurrection says what you cannot do, I can do. Who you cannot be, I am. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Then he says, and you are my brother and my sister. You are my bride because you are the church and the church is my bride. And we have all kinds of references to Jesus or to the church as the bride of Christ. He says, I am among you, around you, within you. I am in your world, in your mind, in your heart, in your world. I am between you and your neighbor, building a bridge called love. I cannot count how many times, well, before I say that, let me say, Jesus is saying to us, I am. I am not a yardstick. I am not a ruler. I am not standing beside you and judging you. I am the living and the resurrected word living inside of you, loving you, forgiving you. I can't count how many times in the Bible there is references to the laws being written, the laws of God being written on the human heart. Here's one from Proverbs. My children, keep my words and store up treasure my commands within you keep my commands and live keep my teaching as the apple of your eye bind them on your fingers and write them on the tablet of your heart a little bit of a different look isn't it we should never give up trying to keep all the Ten Commandments as faithfully as we possibly can. But at the same time, we need to remember that the burdens we struggle to bear and the love that we are always so unworthy to receive, the forgiveness we need and the commandments we feel to obey are not judgments, they're mercy. Jesus Christ is the Ten Words personified. He is the generous bearer of mercy. And the purpose of these words is to help us to be the best people that God can make us to be. And so, at this point, Pastor Chris would say something along the line, I think that's good news. <laughs> and we'll end right there. And then he would say, let's pray. And so, for our prayer to end today, I am going to use the last stanza of the 119th Psalm, verses 169 through 176. The psalmist prays, and we with him. Let my cry come right into your presence, God. Provide me with the insight that comes only from your ten words. Give my request your personal attention. Rescue me on the terms of your promise. Let praise cascade off of my lips. After all, you've taught me the truth about life. Put out your hand and steady me, since I've chosen to live by your counsel. I'm homesick, God, for your salvation, and I love it when you show yourself. Invigorate my soul so that I can praise you well and use your decrees to put iron in my soul. And God, should I wander off like a lost sheep, seek me. 
Look for me. I will recognize the sound of your voice, your word. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds on Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> so we have received, hopefully, some assurances. So why don't we go ahead and sing about them?